tuned into Quick Charge, the high voltage podcast bringing you the top stories in electric vehicles and sustainable energy daily. And it's all powered by electric. Welcome to Quick Charge. It's July 29th, 2024. I'm your host, Joe Boris. We're going to start today's news the same way we do every Monday with some exciting stuff from Tesla. Elon Musk signals reaching the limits of Tesla's Hardware 3 despite self-driving promise. Back in 2016, Musk announced that all Tesla vehicles built going forward would have, quote, all the hardware to enable self-driving. At one point, he even specified level five self-driving, which is the highest level and means capable of driving anywhere, anytime, under any condition without human intervention or supervision. Shortly after this claim, the CEO signaled that Tesla was most likely wrong as it could need more computing power on board the vehicle to run the self-driving system. And that's when Tesla introduced Hardware 3. Musk claimed that this computer would enable self-driving and everyone who bought the full self-driving package on prior vehicles would get a computer retrofit for free, or rather included in the price they paid for FSD. Since then, Tesla has introduced Hardware 4, a more powerful onboard computer for its vehicles. Tesla is not offering prior vehicles a retrofit with this new computer, as it insists that HW3 is capable of achieving self-driving through future software updates. Last year, Musk went as far as claiming that FSD would get better on HW3 first, as Tesla's focus needs to be on getting FSD on HW3 working super well and provided internationally. He went as far as claiming that FSD performance on, quote, HW4 will lag at least six months behind HW3 because of this. That comment was less than a year ago, but the situation has already reversed. Now, speaking of situations that get reversed, Tesla confirms that Cybertruck's range extender has to be mounted by a service department. Now, why is this another example of the situation being reversed? Because the Tesla Cybertruck does not actually meet the specifications, especially the range that it was originally launched with or that it was originally announced with. Now, that's also true of the $39,000 price range, but we're going to ignore that for the moment. Fred writes, Tesla announced that it will make a range extender available for the Cybertruck. The Cybertruck's range extender is an extra battery pack that sits in the truck's bed, taking up about one third of the vehicle's cargo space. The car maker disclosed that the battery pack would increase the range of the dual motor Cybertruck from 340 miles to over 470 miles and the Cyber Beast from 320 to over 440. Tesla has yet to launch the range extender or confirm its price, but code on its website for the configurator briefly showed a $16,000 price. Again, people are disappointed that you're going to have to pay extra money and lose cargo space to get the range that Tesla originally announced. But more than the cargo range, Fred doesn't really get into this. This is going to be a significant weight penalty on the truck. That's going to affect not only cargo capacity and payload capacity, it's also going to affect towing So I think even the most, let's say, convinced or the most ardent believers of Tesla Cybertruck who see this thing as becoming the next mainstream pickup to rival Ford and Chevy and Ram. Was it the best selling electric pickup last quarter? Yes, absolutely. Do I think that's going to maintain? I don't think so. And I think that things like this are the reason why people who buy trucks, especially work trucks, especially people who tow, they want to depend on their trucks. They want to know that the promises being made by the manufacturer are going to be followed through on. And I don't think stuff like this is setting the right standard. If you disagree with me, let me know in the comments. Now, that's a lot of digs at Tesla. Maybe we can talk about whether or not they deserve it. But one thing that they have done, they've released supervised full self-driving 12.5 on wide release. Musk again recently said that he believes Tesla could deliver on its promise of an unsupervised full self-driving system by the end of the year, or that he will, quote, be surprised if it doesn't happen next year. The CEO doesn't have much credibility with these predictions, writes Fred Lambert, as he said the same thing every year for the last five years. And I I think it's actually longer than that, but uh, hey, I'm not gonna argue with Fred on this. Musk has hyped up Tesla's two latest upcoming software updates, 12.4 and 12.5. For 12.4, the CEO said that it would come without steering wheel nag and would be able to drive five to 10 times more miles per intervention. However, Tesla encountered issues internally and limited external testing and ended up never releasing the 12.4 update to the wider fleet. Instead, Tesla is going directly to 12.5 wide release. This tweet from Elon Musk on X, FSD 12.5.1 starts wide release today. Connect your Tesla to Wi-Fi to receive the update. 
when talking about 12.5 and 12.6 last month, Musk claimed that, quote, it will take over a year of driving to get even one intervention. So let's see how that goes. If you have 12.5, if you're getting 12.5, definitely let us know if you get to go uh, a full year without an intervention. I expect a few comments within a matter of days. And again, that's not a dig on full self-driving. It's not a dig on Tesla. It's not even a dig on Elon, really. It's this idea that he's being fed bad information, which is a story we covered a couple of weeks ago, that he is being put into this sort of bubble where he's allowed to believe his own hype. And that is clouding his judgment as he makes these public comments and makes these public goals. And it, in turn, is affecting the stock price. So definitely let us know what you think of that. I think it's something that deserves watching and it'll be interesting to see if 12.5 can live up to the hype another tesla product that is definitely not living up to the hype is the tesla semi now that said there is some good news for the tesla semi tesla has unveiled a rendering of its upcoming semi factory that's going to build electric semi trucks on an automated line First unveiled in 2017, it was supposed to come to market in 2020, but only officially entered production in late 2022 with Tesla employees hand building the semis for delivery to PepsiCo. In October of 23, we learned that Tesla had only built about 70 Tesla semis. In January of 23, Tesla announced an expansion of Gigafactory Nevada to build the Tesla semi in volume. However, more than a year later, we haven't heard much. That is, until last week, when Dan Priestley turned to X to post photos showing that ground had been broken on the foundation of the new factory. Now, he posted those pictures of that foundation under construction, along with the rendering of what the finished product was going to look like, and it looks absolutely massive. I'll zoom in here a little bit. You can see all the work that's going definitely underway. You can see the scale of it when you see all the semis in the background and pickup trucks in the front. Not a lot of cyber trucks being used by these contractors. I'm sure that's just a coincidence, but this looks very much like something that's going to be a huge, huge construction project, and we're excited to see it. Now, while we're on the topic of semi trucks and big projects, Cummins' new powertrain test facility in the UK is a massive leap forward compared to rolling road type Mustang or dino jet type dinos that you've seen, I'm sure, a ton of internet videos. Cummins says the new facility positions the company at the forefront of ultra low and zero emissions powertrain development as the industry shifts its focus to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and improving efficiency. That said, these guys are also testing hydrogen, hydrogen fuel cells, and hydrogen combustion vehicles on this dyno. And the steps that they have to take to keep their people safe are kind of mind boggling, especially when you realize that so many of the pro hydrogen crowd are also anti EV crowd and point to things like the difficulty of putting out lithium battery fires as one of the reasons that hydrogen should be accepted. Let's give you a rundown of some of the things that have been done to keep workers in this facility safe. With regards to hydrogen, the test area features a series of safety checks. These include sensors placed around the vehicle and the interior of the facility to monitor for fuel leaks. The interior walls are designed to protect test engineers in the event of an explosion, while exterior walls have been specially designed plates to alleviate blast pressure. Additionally, the HVAC system is capable of renewing all air in the chamber more than once per minute, which helps prevent the buildup of dangerous gas pockets. Now, nothing wrong with any of this. Cummins is doing the right thing here by putting in safety measures that is going to enable it to keep its people safe while they're working and developing on these products. Absolute, hands down, the right thing for Cummins to do. And we support that and we want to celebrate that. Now, that said, this speaks towards the ability of hydrogen to compete with battery electric in the broader market. And that ability I think is fairly close to zero, especially when we're talking about something like hydrogen fuel cell. Is there a place for hydrogen in combustion? I think a lot of people would argue no. Certainly EV absolutists would argue no. It's a pretty inefficient way to use hydrogen, even though it does do a great job of cleaning up diesel particulate emissions. But even when it comes to fuel cells, the hydrogen itself is under tremendous pressure. It is extremely flammable. It may not take six or seven hours to put out a hydrogen fire, but that's because it will all explode very, very quickly and release that energy all at once. So will you have a problem putting out the fire? No. Will it leave a smoldering crater in the middle of the interstate? Absolutely. Which one of those two you think is safer? Go right ahead. And if you think that just because something is common, that makes it easy to isolate, transport, market, cool, and fill, man, you are missing a lot. But hey, 
definitely still something worth talking about, especially as we consider the growth and acceleration of battery electric heavy vehicles. Moving away from all of that stuff, you know, we like to close these shows off with a little conversation about solar and energy. This Texas solar panel recycling plant is powered by secondhand panels. SolarCycle has installed a 500 kilowatt solar array made of reused panels at its recycling facility in Odessa, Texas, which can provide about half the electricity the plant uses. The array, which is made up of both residential and utility scale solar panels, consists of around a thousand decommissioned solar panels that were previously used on Orsted solar farms throughout Texas and Sunrun's rooftop solar projects. When the system reaches end of life, the panels go straight into the recycling plant where they're in turn replaced with more used solar panels that still have life in them. In other words, secondhand panels are making clean power to power solar cycles recycling plant where it's making new products to make new solar panels. Solar cycle says it plans to expand this model to recycling facilities in Mesa, Arizona and Cedartown, Georgia. That's all I've got for today. If you liked what you heard, be sure to like and subscribe. If you didn't like what you heard, like and subscribe anyway.